Can I now ask all four to come up onto the platform, and then we'll go into some uh, general discussion. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you're all polishing up your own um, questions, um, and I'll try and open as much time as I can um, for <clears throat> question and answer from the, from the floor. Can I kick off with one question, one really short and simple question for all of you on, on the panel, um, which is to go back to uh, the Clausewitzian issue um, that I raised at the beginning. Um, we know that Clausewitz talked about the character of warfare being constantly changing and mutable, but the nature of warfare uh, being uh, immutable. It never changes. Um, so that's my... And he also talked about war, as you all know, being an extension of politics um, with the addition of other means, or he might have said that. Um, some translations are slightly different, and it might also be possible that he didn't say it at all, that his wife might have written that because she did most <coughs> of the writing. Um, so my question for you all, actually, is... Let, let's go to that. Where do you stand? I, I don't, I'm not expecting you to, to debate Clausewitz, but where do you stand on this issue? Are we talking about evolution, incremental change... Should we basically just relax? Not really relax, but you know what I mean, intellectually. It's, it's, it's basically what it always has been for the last couple of hundred years. Or are we in the middle of an all-changing revolution? Evolution or revolution? Where do you stand, August? I'll uh, have to answer the Clausewitz question first because I'm sitting right here, I guess. Uh, <laughs> these, these are always a really uh, tough conversations to, to get into because it's easy to want to say nothing's changed uh, and that there are these enduring... Uh, elements that are immutable. Um, and of course, I'll give a, a, a wishy-washy answer, which is yes and, and, and no. <laughs> um, if you go back to that quote that I had on the, on the first slide about the traffic jam, there are certain human aspects that no matter how much uh, technology we may bring into our lives, into our bodies, cognitively and physically in the coming years, uh, I think that we will still experience them, in part because technology is, is, is an imperfect creation of an imperfect you know, person. Um, we will not have these sorts of, uh, of, uh, of, of efficiencies, I think, that we sometimes imagine. Uh, and that's not just a dystopian point of view, I just think it's a realistic one. But, but yeah, I do think there are some fundamental expressions in conflict that are, that are different in terms of w we can have moral conversations about the value of human life or whether, whether civilians uh, can be targeted or not, and, and suddenly the speed with which those kinds of uh, considerations have to be made are going to be doing so at a, at, a, at a velocity that is beyond what we can cognitively cope with. And that is a fundamental change. Um, you know, the, the, I think, corollary question and something that, that Paul had raised before the panel was, when you take a human out of the loop, what does war itself even mean? Uh, and, and I think it actually, you know, goes to your conversation about being very definitional. What is the loop in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, until machines are better at writing code, which they're getting better, uh, there is a human in the code. You know, in effect, uh, there is a human that potentially releases a platform, even if it doesn't, you know, sit in the cockpit. Uh, so, so to again, kind of, you know, wrap this this question up, I would say that there are elements that are changing, but we're still going to have these enduring human, you know, w uh, traits, if you will, that will probably speak to the the difficulties and inefficiencies uh, that we often wish technology would bring us, but in fact, it it, it never really quite robs us of of, the, mm -hmm. of that truly human experience. Anya. Um, completely agree, basically. Um, this yes and no, and... Um, got it right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> Yay. Um, no, but um, there is definitely revolutionary potential in this technology. It changes a lot. Um, in the end, it's still like destroying stuff, killing people to reach a goal. Um, I think that, that will remain... Um, uh, that will remain an element, to be an element of warfare, and I don't think that autonomous functions will eliminate the human completely there. There will be still civilians around, so if you have a machine, it will find in a certain region, and you will have civilians and other, uh, yeah, civilians, soldiers probably, too, around, so there will be humans in there, there will be people dying, and I think that will remain. I'll leave it there. Yes, um, very short. Is it something principally completely new or unnatural or something like that? I would say no. Is it a revolution? Yes. And I think uh, just to explain that a little bit, we have seen revolutions in technologies before. Mm -hmm. And if you just go back, let's say, to around 1900, we had the 
combustion engine leading to the airplane, to the submarine, electricity leading to all kinds of new things. The rapid change at that time was amazing. If you had asked some people around 1900 what they would have wanted for their, their military force, they would have said more horses. Twenty years later, they wanted tanks, airplanes, submarines. So we have seen this before. So in one sense, it's a revolution, yes, but it's, we have handled this before. So in my view, it's something we have seen before, and I'm sure we're going to handle it this time as well. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I kind of take the same starting point, but uh, com maybe a different uh, answer in the end because I'm kind of conservative. I'm a historian also, so that then I, I would very much say that everything is evolution. I'm very, very careful about using the world word revolution. Uh, I think try to think about it ten times at least before I use that word. And say, for instance, cyber domain. We've been talking about uh, NBF and cyber domain since the 1990s. So even in, say, the short period of time, it's been around for quite some time. So it's an evolution. And also going back, say, to nature war, and as you started out with, and you say it remains, the people remain in that one. Uh, war is in the final end even from, say, hybrid to maybe sometimes robotized war, hi highly autonomous, it still comes down to a bloody war with human sufferings in the end, and, that, and the will of the people, and that is kind of the nature of war. I'm kind of some of those uh, growing up with Hugh Strong and cha changing character of war in that community, and I like that distinction. Character of war is changing, nature of war is is very, very often quite stable. I, to apply it on a couple of the, uh, today's issues, I also think of it in a conservative way to try to limit what we call, say, for a hybrid domain, for instance, in cyber, to call it war, warfare, um, uh, an armed conflict, because it requires different responses, as uh, some other people also mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, not putting it into the war fighting and coming up with a military response to a political war, in a sense. Uh, and also is going back to the UN and the definitions we have of armed conflict. It was million, of pe millions of people who died from making those kind of definitions we already have. So talking about it that you are doing a political competition for influence at the political level, it's kind of disrespectful to millions of people <coughs> who have died in war, I think. So it's, to me it's competition. Coming to robotics, it might change in the future. If, if you have two forces, of robot robotized armies fighting each other, you can actually destroy the will of a nation by destroying the autonomous capabilities of that nation. So then we can talk about maybe even changing what we today define as nature of war. So, but that's a longer term. Oh, thank you all very much. Um, <coughs> we'll go to the audience now. But it, it seems to me that, um, that you know, if if we if we can be reasonably confident that the nature of war is what it is, then I think. At the very least, we have to accept that, it's, that, that this unchanging nature uh, is showing that it can change its character at a really alarming rate <laughs> yep. and keep changing back again. And maybe that's what's most disturbing at the moment. August. Yeah, since we're at a, at a fairly academic conference, I think it's worth you know, pointing out, too, that you know, the really big national security issues we're, we're trying to get our heads around here and, and when we go back to our, our day jobs uh, are racked with definitional challenges. When you get a room of AI experts together and say, what's AI? You're going to have a different answer for a different person. You get a, a bunch of low-intensity conflict experts, they're all going to have different definitions of what hybrid warfare is. Uh, autonomous weapons, you know, is it a, a thing with wings or is it code that hacks the YouTube algorithm to get a disinformation campaign out there and does it with swarm tactics? So, you know, I think that's something you, you brought up as well. And it's a really big issue that if you think about it from a national priorities level, just being able within a government to establish definitional boxes can be as useful as any one technological innovation itself. Thanks, August. Let's have some questions then. Um, if I could ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to stand and give us your name and your affiliation, if you're proud of it. Um, and <laughs> and, and if, you could, if you could keep your question to uh, something nice and concise for our panelists. The first one is you, sir, in the, in the middle at the back, and then the second one there. And stand up. Yeah, sorry, further back. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Thank you, and thank you for great presentations. I'd like to, uh, my name is Halvar Nautakir. I'm a historian affiliated with the University of Oslo. 
I, I am proud of it. It's only 20% still. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask Yartinga uh, Dindal, uh, and with his historical perspective, uh, about uh, countermeasures to influence operations. And I appreciated the, the parallel to, to the Cold War. Uh, with what has changed, uh, evolution uh, or uh, evolved since then, uh, but in terms of technology, how do you see the military's role uh, changing, if at all, compared to how how um, uh, intelligence and countermeasures have been divided uh, according to geography with police uh, domestically and the military abroad, uh, with geography playing less of a clear role uh, with the current technology. Do, do you see that changing? And also with the, the uh, at, least, uh, at least this blurred <laughs> limit between conflict and politics and war uh, as, as before. Does that have to change? Does the, military, does the military's role have to, have to change? Excellent, thank you. The second question is going to be you, sir, in, along the aisle here. But yeah, over to you. There's some people are calling this the the cognitive dimension of warfare. Um, how do you how would you answer the question? Yeah, um, so especially in the field of cyber and hybrid, what we see today and uh, political warfare. To uh, to put it that, uh, uh, military responses is part of it. I think uh, I argue very much that it's not a full military response that is required to those challenges, but the military could be part of it, and especially with in intelligence services. Uh, it goes together with the police, with the, and the responses that I see that it emerges now because hybrid is kind of boomed after uh, Ukraine, Russia's affair, and in political involvement in both uh, Europe and the US. So it's been kind of responses to that. And we, we actually come up with responses. And what I see today that's quite effective, we're coming up with tactical responses on um, exposure. Exposure, that is new. Intelligence services, counterintelligence, I always watch what others have been doing, <coughs> but it's, not been, it's been dealt with in diplomatic terms. Now you see that, okay, we need exposure for what you're doing. Um, a second point is uh, resilience, say resilience in the population, is that you build awareness about these issues and then people get more aware and then we are able to separate what's, what's true and what is not true, and you can deal with it in that sense. I also think that some of the responses, and that is not mainly military, is to, uh, is to get back some of the, say, the open internet, is both on a human editorial role, but also on uh, computing technologies, artificial intelligence and responses to that. But then again, it's a difficult balance, uh, vice versa, uh, censorship. Uh, so there are some difficult questions in how we tackle these things because in that sense uh, the, the challenges we see in cyber and hybrid today are different than those of the Cold War. So there are differences absolutely also. John, uh, Just a brief uh, comment and thanks slightly different but uh, NATO has defined uh, the cyber domain as a domain uh, similar to land, sea and air. And if you accept that uh, what does that also mean? It can mean uh, for a country like Norway, we are very depending on NATO for help in crisis and, and uh, wartime situations, and uh, reaction time is an issue. But in the, the digital domain, we can have help from allies almost in instant time. That would have been interesting to, to look more into. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Second question, sir. I'm unaffiliated. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Stördal. And uh, we have heard a great deal about um, challenges, technological challenges, including digital challenges. But there are also political challenges. And the main political challenge for Norwegian defense these days, in the medium term, and that means five years, that's to reach the uh, aim of, uh, or a commitment rather, of using 2% of our, defend, of our uh, gross national product for defense. And that is an <coughs> aim which, uh, as things uh, matters stand at the moment, seems unattainable. So my question is actually, how can one possibly use or employ technological advancements in order to close that gap 
or more realistically perhaps to compensate for that gap in a matter in a manner that might be acceptable for our NATO allies. Thank you. Thank you. John, the two percent question. <laughs> well, thank you for a very easy question to answer, yes. Um, well, anyway, uh, whether or not Norway is uh, going towards the, the two percent or reach the two percent goal, that's a more or less a political question, which I will not uh, go into here. But what I can do is to, uh, to say that we have been asked by the, at uh, FFI, by our Ministry of Defense, to look into uh, possible ways to increase the defense budget. This has been openly published, our, the, the mandate for this work, and we actually will publish it on, on Friday this week. And there you will see what we have been doing is to look into different possible uh, directions how to develop our armed forces. And uh, I can give a sneak preview. There will be four different directions. And we look also, uh, give examples of what type of investments can be made in order to strengthen the different directions. Um, so um, uh, that will partly answer your question, I think, on, on Friday. And uh, what's important there is also the scalability because uh, I think the official version is Norway is working towards the 2% goal by 2024. So we will present different directions with scalable solutions um, uh, covering um, this gap as you presented. I think it's fair to say that it was, a, it was and remains a fairly soft um, commitment. I mean, it's not a treaty undertaking. Um, I think it was first voiced in 2006, then again in 2014, when the Allies said they would work towards 2%, as you said, John, over a, over a decade. So th there's still a bit of the decade left, which is why I think it's still uh, very much under discussion. Um, but as you said, sir, it is a politically charged <laughs> uh, question. What I'd like to do is, is pick up, I, th I think I have three more questions on, on my note here. And what I'd like to do is to have all three of those, and then we'll come to the panel to answer uh, all of them. Or those they wish to answer in, in sequence. Madam. Yeah, my name is uh, Darla, and I have one question related to uh, how you can ensure or the authority or the government ensure uh, allied or Norwegian control uh, over critical technology related to digitalization uh, in crisis war, and especially if you relate it to the fact that uh, the ownership um, uh, of this uh, is... Uh, hugely international through transnational companies and multinational companies. Thank you. How do we ensure government or other control over critical technology? The second question was, I think, yes, sir, yeah. Just behind you, yeah, a bit further back. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Brad Urchenberg and I work for the Norwegian Army. Um, my question goes to the the threshold of uh, of war. Um, you see, uh, taking going off the example of drones, uh, you've seen a, a lowering of the thresholds of using drones towards uh, technological inferior adversaries. Mm. Uh, I am wondering, going off the uh, the topic that was discussed here yesterday, um, the advancement of you know a more multipolar world <coughs> order with uh, peer adversaries. Uh, how do you think the current technological trends uh, affect the um, threshold of entering war and conflict? Thank you, Lawrence. And then the question right at the back. I th yes, so not right at the back. Yeah. Hello, I'm Karsten Fries at, at NUPI. Um, last time we had the revolution in military affairs, they talked about it in the 90s, it was kind of overtaken by Afghanistan and Iraq experience. In other words, Kalashnikov was <laughs> back in, you know, killed more people and it kind of, it was shelved and we had to deal with other kind of wars. In other words, in other words the adversaries adapt uh, when, when we have advantages, they find other ways to improvise responses. So again, are we, are we, is it the risk this time as well that we look as blind into this, you know, technological future and forget about conventional uh, other ways mm. of, of fighting back? Are we losing a sense of our own history and so on? Was there another question somewhere that I missed somebody? No. In that case, we will start at the far end with Yat, and if you'd like to answer all of those questions yeah. in about a minute. 
<laughs> I think I talked too much, so I can't answer all of them. But the, to the last one, it's a very good question, and I, something I left out completely on my slide, and that was because I focused on the technology drivers these days. And I, absolutely, for NATO, it is kind of the high-end uh, threat to, uh, against Russia, or uh, what Russia is portraying, but also the southern, uh, the Middle East, uh, North Africa, absolutely. It is an uh, instability and pervasive <coughs> instability that is driving things. Um, but it is not a driver for military technology and thinking these days, and that is uh, a concern as uh, the thinking at least that we need to keep uh, focus on that. So it was deliberately left out, but as a threat, it is still there. Just a short one on uh, the threshold of war. I think uh, it's an excellent example to use drones, both on the use of drones, but also the use against drones, to taking down drones, and it doesn't lead to a military conflict or a diplom uh, diplomatic uh, crisis, as it had done uh, previously, when a manned aircraft had been taken down, for instance. Um, but I go back to what I tried to say also during the presentation, I, I think it's, uh, or a former reply, I think it's very important to keep those thresholds, that even though they are under pressure, I'm striving to kind of keep the thresholds for what is war, because there are so many things that we can deal with in the diplomatic sphere rather than going to armed conflict over it. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, also the last question first. Um, I think the type of warfare we saw, let's say, in Afghanistan was uh, was, was not against an advanced um, adversary. And uh, I think, in general, we have a tendency to overestimate the effect of new technologies in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And uh, maybe not very visible in Afghanistan, but if you look at the number of drones the Americans brought in, Early on, it was only a handful of drones. And if you compare that to the number of drones they had in Afghanistan 10 years later, it's, you can add uh, it's a factor of hundred, hundreds. So even there, you saw this type of change, but maybe not as fast as predicted in, in the 90s. So to answer your question shortly, I think we will see this uh, change this time, and as we have seen before. Um, also, uh, this with the threshold of war, I think, uh, especially in the digital domain, where attribution is, uh, um, is really challenging. I think you can see blurred uh, kind of uh, differences between uh, peacetime crisis and war. Uh, I think, that, well, in that case at least. And to the first question about uh, the critical technology, I, I just would like to mention that in Norway we have a new law coming up right now looking into the, uh, the kind of security issues. It's a modernization of the old law. And here the, um, uh, the spread of critical technology from Norway to other countries has been um, uh, one of the key issues addressed in, in this law. So it's a very important question that has been addressed. And there is uh, uh, um, some solutions there that I think will help at least. But I think that's an issue that we have to re revisit continuously. Thanks. Anja. Mm -hmm. um, starting with the, with the first question, um, yeah, I think that that's a huge problem to remain in control of something like I'm not sure if we were going there, but many in control of supply chains, for example. Um, so all these processes and sensors and all that we need um, has global supply chain chains and maybe comes or is built in China, for example. So in case of war, that might be, <coughs> that might be um, a problem. I think states are increasingly aware of this, um, and there are efforts on that, on that regard to, to have a certain independency there, but um, maybe it's already too late, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, being the uh, optimist here. <laughs> um, no. Yeah, but with all these dual use uh, technologies, it might be hard to have a real closed off autonomous or autark um, system there. Um, threshold of war, I think there are different thresholds. So the one thing is this uh, huge um, discussion about when it becomes a cyber threat uh, war, this Article 5 discussion there. Um, so that's one thing um, to solve, and 
I'm not sure if there's any progress in this debate. It seems mm -hmm. to have it started years ago when I feel it, it's, same, uh, it's still at the same uh, point there where we say, um, well, if there is a, a huge uh, effect, uh, outside world effect, like um, that might be, might, um, the threshold might be crossed, but we'll see if we go there. Um, so that's one discussion, and the other is, um, especially with drones, for example, is uh, is the political threshold, um, the willingness of states to go uh, to engage in armed conflicts, is that lowering? And that might be, that's, that's quite possible. Um, I think if you don't have, if you don't need uh, that many soldiers to deploy there and risking your own uh, your own people there, it lowers the, the costs, um, the political costs, so that's, that might be a reason, or at least kind of an, if not an incentive, but contributing to the decision to engage in an armed conflict. Um, yeah, don't miss on, out on the conventional weapons, definitely. Um, and I mentioned this before, these autonomous functions are kind of sneaking in everywhere, um, so they are very closely linked to all this, uh, uh, all these older debates, if you like, um, and just uh, something adding to this to keep in mind. Thank you. August. I'll, I'll try for all three really quickly. I think on your idea of governmental control of critical technologies, you can bask them into those that are discrete defense products. And I think mm -hmm. some of the frameworks that are being updated in the West about export controls, uh, particularly in the US, we're going through this right now, uh, is, is helpful. The, the really, I think, challenging and interesting you know, question to unpack is the dual <coughs> use or the, the civilian technologies that can be strategically important, whether it's just software or whether it's drones that can, in one role, serve a humanitarian purpose and another you know, a military uh, offensive purpose. Um, the risk in over-identifying every single technology as a potentially military application is that you inhibit the freedom that technology you know, innovators need. Uh, and, and I think we are going to have to start to hold those things in tension so that we accept that there is a growing basket of technologies, many that will not be invented in the countries where we're from, uh, that have massive strategic implications. And we have to uh, be able to understand the movement of that technology is not something that can be controlled from a Western capital. Uh, the threshold of war starting, yes, there's sort of accidental or intentional uh, beginnings. And I think the risk with narrative influence makes the accidental uh, start of wars easier. I think I would push past that to the ending of wars. I would love to think more about how technology can help resolve conflicts. Uh, you know, the reconstruction or, or peace uh, movements that follow, I think, can be heavily influenced by, by technology, whether it's physical reconstruction or, again, reconnecting people in, in very divided societies. And lastly, you know, thinking about the idea of uh, technology and the role that it's going to play in the future of conflict, I look at it in a slightly recent history perspective. The amount that the U.S. spent on protecting U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan kind of went two tracks, uh, particularly against the threat from, from IEDs. There was a very low-tech approach to spend tens of billions of dollars buying big metal boxes with wheels. Uh, and then there was the other, uh, you know, JAIDO, which is a high-tech task force that did everything from, you know, intercepting signals to coming up with machine learning ways to, you know, find, find, find IDs and bombers. That duality is going to be present in future defense solutions too, right? We're going to be doing things that have really low tech uh, and are incredibly expensive because those are capital intensive industrial processes, but we're also going to be and struggling to do the high tech, which is really, really difficult systems engineering, but yet is as crucial to have both married together. Uh, the, the high tech sensor on the simple truck is, is sort of the solution today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, we, we, we must finish. Um, you, not many of you will know what, uh, that the Norwegian Atlantic Committee has, a, has developed a special hand signal which says, what do you think you're doing? You've left 37 seconds for coffee. And I've, <laughs> I've just received that hand signal from the door. Um, so we're going to stop now. And I have to apologize for giving you 35 seconds for coffee. Um, Kate, over to yeah, you. Yeah, okay. But you are granted 15 minutes coffee break, so uh, I think we will manage during the day. Give this panel a brilliant... Uh, brilliant panel, but bringing you here to Winter Wonderland, you need some mittens. <laughs> Handmade. Please, August. <laughs>